You're listening to How I Sell, a podcast built for early career sales professionals. You'll hear stories, best practices, and guidance from top sales leaders on what it takes to become a sales superstar. Today's episode is made possible by Ramped Careers. Ramped is on a mission to build the next generation of workforce-ready talent. Joining us today is Jesse Osborne, Senior Director of Sales Development at Depalti. Jesse has held senior sales leadership and management roles at a variety of companies, including Zero Cater, Jazz HR, and Paychex. Thank you, Jesse, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Jesse, for, for, for those that don't know you, and I know we kind of you know shot the breeze a little bit before, uh, before I hit record, but for people that don't know who you are, who is Jesse Osborne? Uh, that's a big question. Jesse Osborne is someone that, uh, that, uh, that's a dreamer at heart. Uh, I, I think that we can climb big mountains. I think that uh, I think no obstacles too high, and someone that likes to keep pushing and, and strives to get better every day, every day. That's a that's an inspirational view of looking at life, and I I think that uh, ties in well with the with the mountain that you have in uh, in the background there. Have you always been that way? Uh, I'd love to kind of learn a little more about your formative years, right? Because I look back at myself yeah. and, and I say, why am I the way I am, and what's defined me? Tell us a little more about you know kind of your early life, your formative years? Yeah. So yeah, I think what really helped shape me before getting into a career uh, was, uh, was, was family. And uh, I've got a lineage of, of inventors and reformers and, um, you know, hearing these stories from my dad and from my grandpa about uh, my great, great grandpa was a prison reformer at Sing Sing in New York. And he went undercover uh, for two weeks as a prisoner to see what life was like. And his whole intention was to figure out what's wrong in the prison system uh, that when I'm the warden, I can try to make, I can try to fix. It's stories like that, that, that inspired me to say, you know, it, it, here's someone that, that tackled the challenge, thought about it, wanted to make things better. And, and I think that has just been passed down throughout our family of, uh, of wanting to make things better and not accepting the status quo. And so, so that really helped shape me going into my profession uh, what do I want? How do I want to approach my career? And it's not status quo. Let's let's shake things up. That seems like a like like an incredible background, um, and it, it's such an honor to um, to be able to learn from immediate family that's kind of gone out, done incredible things. Right? It sets it sets the bar really high for you. Which it looks like you've done that for yourself. You've set the bar really high. You graduated from 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 college with a with an economics degree. What was your thinking the day of graduation? What did you want to do or become in life? So, so I wish that this was some thoughtful, long-term plan. Uh, so I, I'll be honest with you. When I, when I was getting ready to get out of college, I thought, okay, what do I want to do? And I wanted to impress friends and family and look at this great job that I landed, right? So what it really came down to was uh, a company offered a sales job and that company offered a company car. And I thought, <laughs> man, how, how bad am I going to look rolling up to my apartment in front of my roommates in my brand new Ford Ranger pickup truck? They're going to be so jealous that I landed a gig that had a company car. Did I care about the industry? Nope. Did I care about, did I vet the long-term strategy and is this company going to go IPO? Nope. Didn't think of any of that stuff. It was just, they have a company car and I get a gas card with that. That means that I don't have to pay for gas either, man. This is, this is a gig. This is a dream job. That's and it's outside sales. So I get to, I get to go out and schmooze and meet people. And I, I love people. So great job for me. Right. That, that's self, like, sadly, that's, that's what lured me in. But that's, but you know, it's, 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 it's funny that you bring that up. Um, I get the car and I, I, I get the, I get the sales job. Had, have you, had you at that point, everyone kind of sells something, right? I mean, you, you sell things to family, you sell things to friends, whether it's an idea. Uh, did you have an inclination though, that, all right, sales is something that I'm interested in, or did you just kind of jump into it cold? I, I've always liked the idea of being a builder, right? So, so I think creating something, you know, I, I came from a, I mentioned I came from a, a lineage of inventors and reformers. So I have an ancient ancestor, go, you got to go back like seven generations, uh, that invented the telegraph. Uh, Samuel Morse created the, you know, dot, 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 like, get out of uh, here. Now you go back seven well, you, it, it, I thought it was cool as a kid, but when you go back seven generations, you don't have one or two great, great, great grandpas. You got hundreds of them, right? So <laughs> one of them was that guy. So it's not as cool now that I know the math today, but, but, uh, but thinking about, you know, here's a guy that took something from nothing, took an idea. Mm. And so, so having the, having the building, let's create something and then let's shake up the status quo. Both of those things kind of formed it. So I, I look at sales as something that 
uh, that you could have ownership over, right? It's something that you could take something from nothing. You've got no pipeline. You've got nothing in your hopper. You mm-hmm. got to go make it happen. No one's going to do it for you. And, and I knew that, that I had to drive for that. I didn't have any experience selling or doing presentations, but, uh, but I, I knew that I had the drive mm-hmm. and I, and I thought that I had the charisma. I thought that I had that, that passion to, to shake things up so I could, I could challenge how other salespeople did it and be better than them. So probably a little competitiveness in there too, uh, yeah. peppered in. So uh, that, that was the experience that I had up to that point. Any, any shockers, anything that you kind of didn't expect that hit you smack in the face when you, <laughs> when you started out and you're rolling around in your new car? Yeah. So my very first cold call, and again, this was an outside sales job. Uh, my boss said, Hey, I want you to go cold call this restaurant in Daly city. Yeah. Uh, and I said, okay. So I went and I went and cold called them and I got thrown out of this restaurant. They, they screamed at me and said, never come back in this place. We don't accept solicitors. So I come crawling back to my office and, and I, and I told my boss, Hey, I cold called them. And I, and he, and I don't know if he believed me. And he said, yeah, how'd it go? I said, I they, they tossed me out and uh, they like wrecked the rest of my day. And he said, yeah, well, you passed. I, I send all the new salespeople to that place because I know this is going to happen and want to see if you have the, the grit to tough it out. Uh, and um, and it was uh, so so realizing that not everyone knows you. They don't know. They don't care about you. Uh, when you show up, they've never seen you. They've never seen your email. They've never talked to you on the phone. They've never seen you in person. They don't care if you're a charismatic reforming inventor. You've got passion. They don't care about that. Mm-hmm. Um, like right? you're interrupting their day. Uh, so being able to get through that hurdle of how do I get past that, that mental roadblock of being told no uh, and realizing that, gosh, there's a lot of hearing no, uh, that, that was not very, that's not good for confidence just to hear no all day. But I'll tell mm-hmm. you what turned it around though. Uh, my, my, I'll call him my mentor, uh, the other sales guy in my office. Uh, we were out cold calling together one day and, uh, and he said, uh, and he, this guy had been with the company for like 20 years. So, Keep in mind, I'm like 23, something like that. He's like 40, 44, 45. This guy is like, to me, he's like, we're in the same job, but he's been at it for so long. So, uh, so I'm asking him, like, what's the key to this thing? And he said, you know, it's really simple. Every 10 cold calls I make, I close the deal. So every time I hear a no, it's just one step closer to a yes. Um, and I didn't heard that before. At that time, my career, I'd never heard that. And it, and it really brought some assurance that, wow, this is a numbers game. And mm-hmm. I don't think that's what, most people go into sales thinking about is that it is a numbers game and that no comes with the territory. No is going to be told to you all day long, uh, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. And, mm-hmm. uh, and so if you let those nine no's get to you and beat you up, that, that's when I see people quit. They say sales isn't for me. I didn't get to that 10th. Yes. And uh, here's the guy, this guy been at this for 20 years. So, so I stuck it out there for, for several years at this first job. And I just followed that advice. Just keep going. And, that you don't have to, you don't have to go up and wow everybody with how charismatic you are, and, right? There. But but you got to play the numbers. So once you get a meeting with them, that's where your charisma and your personality come into play. But to get that opportunity to display that, mm-hmm. to show your presentation skills, you got to play the numbers game. You know, it's just, uh, it's interesting you bring that up. You know, to me, it, it's almost a, a switch in perspective, right? There's just two ways of looking at it. One is Oh, I need to go in and I need to just hit some activity metrics. And you think about numbers in the abstract. Another view, which I think is a, is a better view, is, is the one that you had mentioned where, yeah, it's a numbers game, but you do it because you already know that you're going to hit certain outcomes, right? Where you know that at the ninth call, you shouldn't give up because your 10th or your 11th or your 12th call may end up you know, leading to a meeting that might end up into a closed deal. And so that incrementality in thinking, I think will automatically solve for this whole man, this job has too much activity. I think there's too much focus on activity in a vacuum without that other component where, well, why the hell are we doing all of this activity? Uh, and I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up. Great to have, you know, amazing mentors. I think, you know, they, to, to, to a large extent, uh, they really do shape uh, what your career kind of turns up, uh, ends up being. Who knows, you know, whether you and I would have been having this conversation if, if the seasoned seller uh, hadn't shared that piece of advice with you when you were 23. I, it, it, you know, and that's what sales, that's what development's all about. It's taking one nugget at a time and building on top. You're not going to learn everything day one. Uh, you got to build a career. There's a great, um, there's a great Zig Ziglar who, for those who don't know, don't look him up. If you're watching this, it's super old school guy wore like butterfly collars, blue suits, that guy's the old school sales trainer. Uh, but there's a, there's a, a clip of him where someone's in the audience. Uh, and, and apparently this, uh, he's like a, a national sales trainer. So companies would send their teams to his conferences. And there's someone who asks a question, 
uh, or he posed a question to the audience, which is, why are you here today? And one person raised their hand and said, I don't know why I'm here. I've been in sales for 20 years. I don't think I'm going to learn anything. And Zig's uh, response was, have you been in sales for 20 years or have you been in sales for one year, 20 times in a row? And, and it like, boom, blew my head away that, yeah, a lot of times, like your first year of experience, it's not going to be what you, you got to continue to develop on top of that. If you think of that first year uh, and think that the next 20 years are going to look like that, mm-hmm. then, then you're, yeah, you probably shouldn't be in sales if, if that's what you want to do. Yeah. Uh, but if, if you want to take the challenge, if I'm going to get better and better and better and better, eventually you'll find things like Mount McKinley behind me. Great perspective to have. And I, and I wonder if that's, that attitude is, is what helped you accelerate your career trajectory. Because one of the things that I had mentioned was how quickly you rose up the ranks from being an individual contributor to being tasked for the success <laughs> or failure of others, right? Very early on, you've had to hire other reps. And very early on, you've had to manage other reps. How was that transition? Did someone teach you to make the transition? What did you learn being like the manager for the first time? I, I, th- I think the reason why I got into management, again, I'm going to expose myself here. The reason I got into management uh, was not originally because I wanted to help others. That's what you know, every leader I talk to says the same canned answer. I really care about my people. I want to see others succeed. I'll tell you why I got into management. Because I was tired of cold calling. Uh, and I felt like I had uh, I, I'd kind of lived that life. I did it for you know, set like years and years and years, and I was ready to try something new. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but I'll tell you why I stayed in management. I think this is probably the bigger takeaway. Uh, so I hired this guy at Paychex. That was my first sales manager position. Mm-hmm. And I hired this guy. He was coming out of a nonprofit and uh, where his job was to, was to help troubled teens find jobs at like pizza places, right? So it was kind of selling, but not, it wasn't a transactional monetary sale. So, uh, so I asked the guy, I said, why, so why do you want to go into sales? Like you're going to go into a corporation. We're going to count your numbers and activities. You're going to have a quota. Uh, and his answer was, my wife is pregnant. And, uh, and I don't want to raise my daughter in, in an apartment. I want to afford, I want to be able to buy a house. And it was a light bulb moment for me as a leader that it's not about me teaching them everything. It, it's about them having an internal motivation. And I think as, a, as what leaders have to understand is that there's motivation and inspiration. And leaders can inspire, but you've got to have motivation yourself. I can't motivate you. I can inspire you and I can try to flush out your motivation but when you take a guy like this that said, my motivation is to, is to save up money to buy a house. You think I got to call this guy and tell him to make more cold calls. He's not doing it for me. He's doing it for his daughter. And here's the, here's like the rounded, the, the end of that story. The guy ends up buying a house two blocks away from me. Mm-hmm. And I see him all, I still see him all the time. And now I see him with his two kids and his wife walking around the neighborhood. And it's just, it's uh, to me, that's why, that's why I love leadership. And I love being able to hire folks and and identify what is your motivation? What is your why, right? Why do you want to be into sales? Mm. What are you going to get out of it? Because sometimes that phone feels like it's 10,000 pounds, right? And, uh, and, and if you put a picture on your desk of like, what's that end game look like for you? Man, like it, 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 can, it can go a long way. So to me, the reason I got into management is different than the reason I stayed into it. Uh, and, and I never looked back since. So I've, I've been in a formal leadership position now for, I guess, 10 years, a little over 10 years now. Such a refreshing perspective on hiring. Uh, one of the things that you hear today is a lot of fluff, and we don't have to get into you know, whether there's a rational basis for this or not, but you'll typically hear sales leaders, some of them say, oh, I want to hear why you're passionate about selling you know, my back office automation software, especially if someone does not come from a sales background, does not even come from you know, whatever underlying industry that this software is trying to tackle. But you don't have a lot of people that, that say, I just want to know what drives you, what motivates you, because that in and of itself will solve for a lot of issues that you see when people do start hiring. Uh, so that was your light bulb, light bulb moment. Uh, and you hired this person, even though he didn't really have a formal sales background, just from getting a pulse of his internal motivations. Is that right? It, you know, it, it, uh, it, when someone is, has a focus on trying to get to that result and you don't have to force them to that result, that they want to get to that result. Uh, our relationship has becomes very different. My relationship with that person now is how do I help you buy a house? It's not, how do I get you to make more calls? Right? So I, I think step one for any sales professional, someone who's considering to go into sales or, or maybe someone who's 
debating leaving sales uh, should be to if if you can articulate what your reason for being in sales is, mm-hmm. then stick with it. Find a good leader, find a good company, and 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 ride that wave. Uh, if if you, if your answer is just I want to have some extra spending cash, but it, it, it like those tough days aren't going to be that fun, right? Those are going to wear on you. Yeah. Right? But uh, but if you see the the bigger picture to it, uh, it, it makes makes that building you're building your career uh, it doesn't happen overnight, right? So uh, that it, that step one is like identify what that motivation is for you. What what other what other attributes do you look for? Um, you in particular, you have quite a bit of experience hiring folks that are fresh out of college or may have a year's worth of experience. You yourself mentioned that you, you can't put an incredible amount of emphasis on year one of experience because who knows? You, there, there's a thousand things that happen that are outside of your control. You might end up at a company that has no product market fit or you, know, you may have bad sales training. There's various reasons why year one may have been great or shit um, for the lack of a better word. What other attributes do you look for when you interview uh, you know, candidates that want to pursue, let's call it an SDR job or a BDR job? I, I, think, I think a demonstrated work ethic, right? So uh, so if you're going into an SDR role and you don't have traditional sales or SDR experience, if you can articulate your strong work ethic. Uh, so one example I have is a, is a guy that, I, that is on our team today that um, the, the guy put himself through college by working at a grocery store, pushing, pushing the carts around and bagging groceries. He wasn't doing keg stands. He wasn't partying. That guy put himself through college. Uh, and that's someone to me who uh, I, I don't care how much sales experience you have. That's what we're here to do is train you on that stuff, right? Uh, but but we can't train on things like motivation, can't train on things like work ethic. Those, those are attributes that come with you. Those are my top two. And I know I'm supposed to say things like outgoing and you're competitive and uh, and you're results driven. And those are all important things, of course. But uh, to me, those are the two things that if I can identify that in an interview, I know I, I can help fill in the rest. And, and that's that. But that's that's my job, right, is to help. Uh, facilitate your learning curve, learn our business, learn the product, learn the sales tactics uh, mm-hmm. to be successful. But if you bring that work ethic and you bring that motivation, we'll, we'll meet together. And uh, my, my whole theme, man, it, it's about retention. Uh, it, anyone on my team will tell you the same thing. It's that this is not about churn and burn. This is not about if you miss your quota, you're fired. To me, this is about how do we lift people up? How do we help you be successful? It, it's the reason why I've had success throughout my career building teams. Uh, is because we, we focus on building people up, not tearing them down. You know, it's a harder path to take. One, and I think it might be a minority view, is that let's just hire someone, give them 90 days. If they don't work out, they don't work out. And I think that's a, it's a cop-out. Perhaps it's, a, it's an easier route to take because it, 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 it takes away the responsibility from you as a sales leader and puts it or pins it down on 21 year old who's out there, generally speaking, wanting to do a good job. This has been my philosophy and I'd love to kind of pick your brain on this uh, on whether you, you agree or have an alternate view. The vast majority of people, I don't think wake up and say, I'm going to do a spectacularly crappy job today. I think the vast majority of people okay. are well-intentioned um, and they try to do a good job. I, I, is that what you've seen of, among all the reps that you hired? You know, some of the reps that didn't pan out, right, despite the, uh, the training and having some baseline level of internal motivation, what are some of the things that folks that, you know, I, I guess didn't work out, what did they do? I, and so, so curiosity, I, I think, is really, really important when you're new to a company. So any company you go to, likely you're not going to have experience working in that industry. And for, for SDRs, BDRs, you might not have experience in selling in general, right? So, uh, raising your hand, asking the questions mm-hmm. uh, to, to, to show that, uh, not th- I shouldn't say to show that you want to do better, but to actually want to learn what you're talking about. Uh, is, uh, that's a characteristic that I've seen over and over again. I can tell you about one, one of our top uh, SDRs today. Uh, we, have a, we use Slack, mm-hmm. and we have a channel uh, that, uh, that's called Ask the SCs, Ask the Solution Consultants. So this is when, so we use this Slack channel when we're on a call with a prospect and they ask us a technical question about how this and that works. And so our SDRs will go into Slack and say, hey, SC's got a prospect asking a question about blah, 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 right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they get a response and then they can respond to that customer or to that prospect. Um, and, I, and I counted, because I was bored one day and I counted how many questions do the SDRs ask in these, in these groups? And over a, over a couple month period, we had 60 questions mm-hmm. uh, posed in this Slack channel 
30 of them were by one person. And guess who, guess who the number one person on that team was? Probably the one with the, with the 30 questions. It's right, right? It's not, and he's not asking because he's trying to show, look at me, I ask a lot of questions. Mm-hmm. He's trying to learn. And, uh, and that's someone who, who shows engagement, uh, if you're curious in that. So, so I would encourage anyone who's, who's struggling a little bit, take time to learn, right? The, the information is not going to always come to you. Uh, you you got to go seek it out. And that's, uh, that's what we got to do in sales, right? Uh, it'd be great if prospects called us all the time, uh, but it doesn't work like that. <laughs> do, you, do, you see that do you see that happening ever? Um, you know, do you have a B2B sales is, is changing. It's changing so quickly, you know, back when, even in 2015, when, you know, when, when we had spent a bit of time doing B2B sales, it's changed dramatically today. One of the trends that I'm seeing is that a lot of your B2B customers expect to have to be treated the same way they'd be treated if it's a B2C sale or a B2C process. I think like those worlds are collapsing very quickly. Where do you see very quickly B2B sales going in the next five years? Uh, it, we're, we're selling to people, right? And uh, when you think about some of the tools that we use in, in sales, uh, Salesforce is an example. Salesforce has been around for a long time. Doesn't look that different than when I first got into sales and, and started to use it. And fast forward today, we've got apps like Uber where we just push a button and a car magically shows up. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, the way that we interact with technology, the way that we want to interact and buy, uh, is we want we we don't want to have complex. We don't want it to be complicated, right? We want to have simple paths to get what we want. So that information flow. Uh, it has got to be simplified. Salespeople, it, to me, I think in the future, in five years, in, um, it depends on who you ask, but that could be a long time from now or it could just be a blip. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, uh, but I think as we move to the future, uh, I think the way we interact with prospects, uh, they're, they're very used to our techniques. So here's an example. Uh, 95% of SDR send an email with a call to action mm-hmm. at the bottom that says, uh, how does next Tuesday at 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock work for you? Or something of that variation, right? Uh, assuming that, you know, I'll just give this person a simple, oh, this time works better. Like we're trying to trick them. And, and I, I think a better approach is to say, hey, if you've got 10 minutes, here's three things that I'd love to cover with you. Mm-hmm. Right? So uh, now if that information is, is interesting to that prospect, they'll agree to 10 minutes. Right? Um, but if you say, well, let me tell you everything about us. And hey, let's spend another 30 minutes talking about me and my company, mm-hmm. how great I am. Not really interested. So I think, I think how we, uh, the tactics have to have to evolve a little bit. Uh, but I think, but it's also a mindset difference too. Yeah. Uh, that that they were they were adapting to. You, it's not about tricking people anymore. Yeah, you said that at the beginning of the call, right? Where you're you're interrupting someone's day. You're not entitled to somebody's time, and you have to make a case for why somebody needs to speak to you. And I agree with you. I think those techniques are getting very old. Six years ago, uh, a prospect would be blown away if they saw a dear first name personalized email uh, coming from an SDR. Today, man, I can, I can, I, I used to do that myself. I can sniff that garbage from a mile away. The days of just sending a thousand emails, throwing crap against the wall and seeing what sticks, it's gone, right? And so now there's like this new wave of personalization where, you know, and this is just the skeptic in me, right? Where the new wave of personalization is, let's just try and find something in common. Oh, you went to the school? Well, my, you know, great uncle went to the same school. Uh, we both like golf. Let's set up a time to talk about, you know, your IT needs. Kind of working for now, yeah. but for how long, right? Because you get 15 other emails, you're going to catch on pretty quickly, right? 15 people are finding something in common with you and want to spend time and that's going to get old. So I think it's a constant cat and mouse game of how do we get someone's attention. Uh, and I agree with you. I think, you know, being self-aware that you're not entitled to someone's time might, might make all the difference. I think you hit the nail on the head with the personalization piece too. So there's, it, it used to be like template or personalized. And, and now there's sort of this trend of like, how do you personalize at scale? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and to me, I'm like, if you're personalizing at scale, it doesn't sound like personalized to me, right? Like if you're going to personalize, personalize, make it like actually write that email. I'm not saying you can't put them in a sequence and have mm-hmm. a drip, you know, follow back to that. But in that very first email, man, I'll tell you this, man, and I, I, I don't mean to get on a soapbox about this, but uh, I, I know a lot of other SCR leaders might not agree with this, mm-hmm. uh, but you know, I, I don't have a set. Everybody has to do 50 calls a day or everyone has to do a hundred emails a day. We don't have a, we have, now we track that. So we mm-hmm. know, we know what volume you are doing so you can help back into your number. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, uh, but when I look at our data, when I look at the analytics behind who's doing the best, 
and how many calls and emails are they making? It's all over the board. The, the key is, is not the volume of emails or calls that you're making. It's the quality of it. So mm -hmm. listen, at the end of the day, I, I don't care how many phone calls you make. I don't get, you won't get paid for phone calls, right? Mm -hmm. You get paid to get results. So, mm -hmm. uh, so, so, so I, I think really believing in that and genuinely believing in personalization, not at scale, uh, not at, you know, not some trickery, because uh, then you're just falling into the same trap uh, of, of sending templates yep. uh, that, yeah. that, that say hi, first name and last name, all that stuff. Right. so to me, yeah. it, it's, it's, it's about actually trying to personalize. Yeah. One of the, one of the challenges, and you'll, you'll, you might agree with me on this one. Uh, and I share your sentiment on uh, balancing volume with, with, with outcomes. One of the challenges is if you focus too much on activity and you focus on garbage activity, uh, what in, inevitably happens is that your, your your metrics are kind of off whack, right? Because you focus on some activity, you get a disengaged prospect on the phone, maybe you trick them, that's not going to convert. And then you look at your, your funnel metrics and you go, well, crap, I'm doing 10,000 emails and I'm only getting two meetings. So I guess what I need to do is now send 100,000 emails uh, so I can back into my outcome. And that vicious cycle never ends. And so I'm so glad that you bring that up. Uh, I think it's a balance. There's a balance of what needs to be done so that you're in front of your customer and you have enough touch points, but also what's the quality of those touch points that you're having with them. Exactly. Um, and, and, you know, and that's, that's where you can make your own plan, you know, so going into your, taking a look at the last three months of your metrics, if you want and mm -hmm. saying, all right, this is how many emails and calls I did and here's my result. Uh, so to what you were just saying is, okay, now I have to up this dial up this as a lever to pull to get more. Uh, that it's something to, to think about for sure, but it's not, it's not the answer every time, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, it's really about methodically backing into your, into your target numbers there. And I think the art and the science of sales have to come together on that. Yeah, that makes, that makes sense. And so, I mean, so you, you don't believe that there's a, there's a magical series of, of emails or a set of magic words that a prospect sees from Tipalti and the next thing they know is they ask you for a contract. That doesn't happen. It's an incremental process. There's somewhat good templates, but then everyone has to make, make it work for them as an SDR or BDR. Yeah, my, my, my team sends out about on a quarterly basis, and I know this because I just had my quarterly business review. Uh, I have a team of 30 SDRs today, and on average, we sent out uh, close to 150,000 emails over a three-month period. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, which one works the best out of 150,000? Right? <laughs> uh, uh, it, it, to me, it's about, it's about finding the right person at the right time. Mm -hmm. There's a funny story about... Um, uh, the second biggest deal that we closed all year last year mm. uh, as a company was sourced by an SDR. And I was so excited to read this email, this first email that this person sent to say, oh, this is going to be gold and I'm going to share this with the whole team. It's going to be amazing. I read the email and it was one of the most boring emails I've ever read. <laughs> I've ever read. But uh, so it's not a good, it's not a template. So when I see other sales and SDR leaders say, here's a template that works. Yeah, man, like 2018 called man. Like it's not about the template anymore. Yep. It's about, did you find the right person with the right pain point at the right time? It's not to me. It's not about, Oh, I hit them on LinkedIn or Hey, I got them on the phone. Like these are old school mentalities. It's not about the tactic. Mm -hmm. It's about, do you have a good value? And can you find the right person at the right time? That's thinking about that problem right now. You figure that out. There's your magic bullet. Yeah, and I find that a little bit troubling about about LinkedIn and, and all of this 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 theory around subject lines and, and and all that jazz, right? I mean, appropriate contact was like the hottest subject line a while back. And the problem is that, especially in the sales community, it's it's, it's very small, and, and and salespeople love selling to other salespeople, right? So if you feel like you landed on something great, you're gonna go share appropriate contact. There's a bunch of webinars, and the next thing you know, as a buyer, you're hey, getting everybody. 15 emails with appropriate contact, and you're like, what the hell is this crap? Do you remember the emails with the GIF? Uh, it was like email number four or five in the sequence. Yeah. And it was like, hey, Minaj, I've been trying to reach you, but, I, but uh, you're not responding to my calls or my emails. So I assume that either A, you're not interested, B, uh, now it's not the right time, or C, you're hanging on the side of a cliff and a crocodile is trying to save and there's a little GIF of a crocodile. Yeah. The first time I got that email from an SDR, I laughed my head up. I sent it to my whole team. And I'm like, guys, let's do this. And then after like the 50th one that I got, I'm like, all right, stop. No more. It's played out. Yeah. And, and I think that's as sales, we got to be adaptable, man. Like you go back to the, to the, to the, to the days, like the 50s, 60s, 70s, whatever, like th they might've just been able to follow the same kind of pattern. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I think this, like right now, every year things change every six months, every three months, things change. Yeah. Right. That, and, and you got to adapt man. you can't bring the, the 2018 playbook is no good in 2020. 
Yeah. Right? So everything I'm saying today, right now, if I watch this in two years from now, I might say, oh, that's outdated stuff. But yeah. th- that's, that's what makes sales exciting, man. Like, and so for, for folks that are, that are either just starting in sales or looking to get into sales, it's not like, don't watch the Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross stuff. That is like, that is like Flintstones. That is the, this we're walking around then, right? This is about, it's about right, the, the evolution and the changes that come up. And, and listen, if, if you've got a voice, if you work for a small company, get yourself a voice, right? Uh, don't rely on the, on the person who's got a playbook from a year or two ago. Uh, I want to be challenged. I don't want someone to tell me I'm wrong. And then let's, let's test it out. So let's, let's adapt. I think that's what you got to do. And who wants to work in a stale, boring profession? Not me. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love I love this philosophy. It's been uh, it's been so interesting to to have a real discussion with someone that you know does it every day, right? And and so I don't have you're willing to kind of bet your you know you you're willing to bet your your, your reputation on this, right? Because you do this every day. You're a sales development leader. You're managing teams, and so uh, coming from you, uh, I'm I'm glad to hear this refreshing take. Uh, and I, I I know we're running tight on time, and I don't want to keep you here for too long. But I do want to ask you one question. Uh, now that you've spent you know quite a bit of time and picked valuable lessons um, in the process, if you could go back in time and meet a version of yourself um, that was younger, just graduating from college, what's the one piece of advice that you'd give yourself? Be patient. No, d- things aren't going to fall in your lap. Right? Uh, it, it's going to take hard work. Uh, and you're going to have to push through. You're going to get. You're you're going to face adversity, especially in that first year in sales. You, you're going to hit. A lot of roadblocks. Uh, be patient. Give yourself time. Uh, don't don't feel like you're you have to be this great, wildly successful person in your first year. Uh, may fail, make mistakes. That's all right. Uh, be patient, and it, it'll come together. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jesse, for being so generous with your time and and, and sharing quite candidly what you've learned in the process and how to build. Uh, and, and, nurture, and nurture a stunning sales team for for anyone that's that's listening and, and is aspiring to be a sales professional. Uh, I guess bottom line is, you know, be patient, be original, have some internal motivation, understand what that is before even you go out and uh, interview for these sales roles, and, and everything else will will fall in line. Uh, on that note, Jesse, really appreciate your time. I appreciate your time too, as well, and uh, best of luck to you, and uh, and uh, thank you very much for the interview. Awesome.